Today we are going to continue um, a series we started last week entitled um, The Significance of the Cross. You know, we're, we're headed into a, a very, um, I guess, uh, popular time in, in the life of Christianity with Easter right around the corner. And so I just really felt impressed of God to just kind of walk through some truth that sort of helps us once again embrace and get our hearts renewed and refreshed in the significance of the cross of Jesus Christ. I uh, just want to start out with some questions. In other words, like when you look at the, the past week, how has the cross made a difference in your life? Think about that. Can you look back at the week uh, and see a time in your life where the cross of Jesus, which, you know, it, it's what it represents, right? I don't know about you, but when I think about the cross, what I think about is I think about the Son of God saying yes to the plan of the Father and vol voluntarily saying, I'm going, yes, I'm going to do it, and coming to this earth and actually laying down, voluntarily laying down his life and dying my death and your death, the death of the whole world. That, that's what it symbolizes for me. For, the, for me, the cross is God's very clear statement to me that I love you. It's his very clear statement to me that you are valuable to me, that like I, I'm willing to go this far to show you that you you are this valuable to me the cross says to me it's it's an open door inviting the world to come and enjoy the greatest treasure of life and that's God himself it's God himself and so a lot of things kind of really impact me when I think about the cross and so for me for me the cross impacts every day because there's times I'm telling you the enemy's whispering in my ear that, that God has abandoned me. That where is God? Is he, he should be here. He should be doing this. He should be doing that. I begin to question, do you love me, God? Do you care about me? And you know what the cross, it reminds me, yes, absolutely I care about you. I want you. You're valuable to me. I am with you. Because when you abandon me, here I am chasing after you, saying, I want you and I want you this, this bad. This is what you mean. And so the question is, do you appreciate, do you really appreciate the death of Jesus? Do you appreciate the cross? Are you growing in your appreciation of the cross? So what, I, what I've been kind of praying about and what I've been asking God is, God, how can we, how can we appreciate it more? Because I can't, I can't look at you today and say to you that you don't appreciate the cross. I can tell you what I think, and I think that we're living in a time when there's so much going on, and there's so many things that are clouding our vision, and there's so many distractions in our life that I think that there's probably some people in this room that, that probably don't appreciate the cross of Jesus like, like we should. So how do we get back to that? Like, like, how do we, God, how do we lead people back into an appreciation to where every day we're just taking time to say, God, thank you. Jesus, thank you for willingly laying down your life. And Spirit, thank you for, for bringing this good news to me and opening my eyes and, and showing me what has been done for me through Jesus Christ. Thank you for that. Because I think sometimes we think about the cross and we think that maybe the message of the cross is just for the unbeliever. The, the unbeliever needs to hear about the message of the cross because he needs to get saved. But I believe that, yes, the, the cross is a message for the unbeliever, but I think it's a message that you and I need to live centered on every single day of our lives because there's so much that it, that it represents. And so there's three things that God has shown me that I, I, I believe um, lead us back into an appreciation to once again embrace the significance of the cross. Number one is this. Number one is the severity of sin. I mean, you've got to admit that we live in a culture that does not see that sin is a very serious thing. As a matter of fact, we live in a culture that basically uses sin to provide entertainment for the world, right? Right? 
Is that not true? And so it's easy in our society get, to get desensitized to it. Like, like you know, it's just, it's just normal. It's, it's, so, so, so what is it going to take to bring us back into an understanding of the significance and appreciation of the death of the cross? I believe it's, once again, you and I understanding and knowing how serious sin really is. So how serious is it? Well, to me, you've got to think about the situation or the predicament that sin has left you in. For example, and I'm going to do the shotgun approach this morning because it's just literally the way God has laid this out. But let me just describe to you how God says, how he describes the situation and the seriousness of your sin. Number one, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12, and you just write it down, you can go back and read these later. But here's what God says about it. It has left you without hope and without God in this world. That's what sin has left you with. That's how serious it is. It's put you in a situation that you absolutely cannot fix, and that sin has caused you to be separated from your life, from your hope, from God himself. That's how serious it is. There's another passage that hit me, 2 Peter 3, 9. Write it down. It says that God is not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance so how serious is sin it has left you in a state of eternally perishing Paul says in another place Romans six twenty three, that the wages the payment for sin is what is death I mean do you get the magnitude of that do you grasp the seriousness of how God says your sin is that because of it the payment is is death so Your eternal destiny, because of sin, has become total darkness, total separation, um, a life totally devoid of God. I mean, think about that. The Bible also describes you and I as sheep. We're all like sheep who have gone astray. And there's, there's, there's something interesting. I don't know how many of you have dogs, but one of the things I know about dogs is that a lot of times a dog will run away, but guess what it does? It finds its way back home. But there's something interesting about a sheep. Guess what? A sheep can't find its way home. And that's how God describes you. That's where sin has left you, like, like a sheep that has gone astray and it's, and it's lost. And it, and it absolutely, no matter how hard it tries, it cannot find its way home back when we look at the bible we also see the seriousness of sin as we walk through the entire thing in the very beginning god established a way that man could worship him he provided a tabernacle and he said i'm going to dwell right here in your midst but in order to come to me sin is so serious i've got to deal with it and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness so i'm going to provide you with this picture of how serious it is and so in order to come to me guess what you're going to do you're going to have to kill animals you're going to have to shed the blood of innocent animals to put yourself in the right situation. In other words, sin has got to be dealt with. It has to be dealt with before you are going to enjoy worship and a relationship with me. And think about it. Think about all the blood that was shed. All the innocent animals that died for the sin of mankind. You see it in the death of Christ. I mean, I don't know, but... Maybe you've taken time through the years to watch movies like The Passion of Christ and you, you see kind of very vividly how his suffering may have been and what it could have looked like and what he could have experienced in his situation. And we look at that and we think about that. Well, what was going on, ladies and gentlemen? Like, like why was he being mocked? Why was he being beaten with that cat of nine tails? Why was somebody pressing a crown of thorns down on his head? Why was he laying himself out on a cross? And why were they nailing him to that cross? Why? Well, Isaiah 53 says that he was doing that for your iniquities. He was being bruised for your iniquities. He was being wounded for your transgression. And so what I mean by this is that when you look at how he suffered, what that is telling you is how, what a big deal sin is. So the church cannot afford in our society that rejoices in what's evil, okay, 
and abhors what is good. We cannot afford to be desensitized by the seriousness of sin because when that happens, it causes us to lose sight of the significance of what Jesus did for us. Because it's easy to say that the guy, the young 19-year-old, I think he was, that walked into the school in Florida and shot 17 innocent people, it's easy to think that that guy needs Jesus. Boy, because what he's done is really, really serious. But do you understand that it doesn't matter how big or how small the sin is. All it took was one sin to leave you without hope and without God. One sin to cause you to perish. One sin to cause you to have to live eternity in total darkness, in total void of God and His presence and all. Just one sin. And not only that, According to the Bible, it didn't even require the action because you were already born in that. You were born separated. You were born without the life of God. So I truly believe that one of the ways to lead God's people back from what God has shown me to to appreciate the cross is to understand the severity of sin. It's captured in all of the words that, like Paul uses in the New Testament, like the word ransom. Have you ever studied the word ransom? What does the word ransom mean? Because it says that Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all. So what is a ransom? Well, a ransom was a price that would be paid to set a slave free. Right? So when you think about that, Jesus gave his life as a ransom for all? So what does that say about you and me? What does that say about the predicament that you and I are in as sinners? What does it say about it? It says that we were bound. That we were slaves, and unless someone had stepped in and paid that price, guess where you would still be? Still be bound. There's other words like the word justified, which is kind of a, a, an accounting term from, from the Greek culture. To be justified means to, to literally, as some scholars would say, it means that God left you through faith in Christ. He left you just as if you had never sinned. But what that word communicates about the predicament that we were in because of sin, it meant that you and I were left with a huge debt that we owed. I don't know if any of you have ever practically experienced like debt in your life. Like, have you ever been at the point in your life when you were just, you you didn't know what you were going to do, you didn't know how you were going to pay bills, you didn't know how you were going to do that, you were overwhelmed with debt in your life and you literally felt like the whole world was crashing in on you and you had no clue where it was going to come from and how you were going to take care of that and how you were going to deal with that. That's where sin left us. Is that literally what you did, what you incurred because of sin in your life, just by being born, it left you in in a place of serious debt. There's other words like the word reconcile, which means to bring two enemies or two parties that are opposed to one another to bring them together in peace. See, sin left you an enemy of God. Sin left you separated from God. Even the word salvation, what is that word? It means deliverance. It's used over and over in the Bible. When you think about, well, what, what in the world do I need to be saved from? I'm not a bad person. But that communicates the seriousness of the situation that you needed to be delivered, ladies and gentlemen. You needed to be delivered. So when you start looking at those words, you you start finding out that sin left you bound, sin left you guilty, sin left you separated, and sin left you with an eternal destiny. To a place called hell. What do you think? I, mean, I don't know about you, but that's a pretty big deal. I'd say sin is a pretty big deal in spite of what this world might want you to believe about it. There's another thing that God has shown me. Not only is the severity of sin Will, will help lead us to an appreciation and understanding of the significance of the cross, but, but also the magnitude of eternity. The magnitude of eternity. Like John 3, 16, let's just think about it for example. What does it say? For God so loved the world, right, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish. 
but have everlasting life. So when we look at that verse and we think, man, what's, what's the real thrust of that thing there? Well, it's easy to say, well, the thrust of it is God so loved the world. And I'm grateful for that. But I think one of the things that we miss there is the fact that God said he sent his son into the world so that the world would not perish. So do we understand the magnitude of eternity? Did we get the fact that apart from God loving you in spite of you and sending his son and his son being willing to go and the spirit of God doing what he did to bring you the truth that you can believe in the truth apart from God's initiation to fix the problem do you realize that our hope was total darkness that our hope was total separation that our eternity was nothing but an eternity devoid of God and everything that was good sound exciting to you? (laughs) I remember one time we were going somewhere, we were on a trip, and we got a phone call. I think we were going to Florida. It's been a long, long time ago. And there was a really bad accident. And uh, right before we got to the accident, I'll never forget it, I got a phone call from a buddy of mine. And he said, look, man, you better take exit so-and-so, because if you go far, there's been a terrible accident, and there have been people waiting in traffic for hours. For hours. And so I was like, oh, awesome. So, man, I'm getting off the interstate. I'm taking this back way. I I never saw the first sign of any traffic. Well, When we ended up getting down there, some seminary buddies of mine told me that literally they sat in traffic for eight hours. Eight hours. I don't know about y'all, but that would be pure, absolute torment for me, okay? To be trapped in a car to be trapped in traffic with a car in front and behind to where I couldn't move for all that time. It would be a nightmare. I mean, stand still traffic for hours, right? So I couldn't help but think about that. That's the image that God gave me because when I look back at that, I think, man, I thank God for that friend that saved me from having to sit in traffic for that long. And when he first called me, I had no idea about the magnitude of how long that wait would have actually been because of that car accident. And you see, that's where we are in this life. We don't understand the magnitude of an eternity without God. We don't understand that. We don't think about that. We don't understand that God said, hey, I sent Jesus to you. That if you just believe, then you can avoid an eternity of perishing. So I don't know about you, but when I think about the cross, and I think about that God used Jesus and the cross to fix that, so that instead of perishing, I could have everlasting life, then I don't know about you, but I'm like, praise God. There's also another thing. The severity of sin, the magnitude of eternity, but also there's the holiness of God. 1 Peter 1.16, well, it doesn't, it's, it's a theme throughout the Bible from the beginning of the end. It always states the fact that God is holy. What does it mean that God is holy? It means that God is separate. That God is separate from you and I and from his creation in every way. And so he's separate in the fact that, you know, the Bible even talks about him, him not even being able to look, to look upon sin. Now, I don't fully understand that because God sees everything. I don't, I don't get that. But I also understand that Jesus was not an afterthought for God. Do you understand that? It was not like, oh, good gracious, look what, look what Eve did. Look what Adam and did. They are, they are so foolish. They have just messed everything up. So let me scratch my head for a minute and let me figure out how I'm going to fix it. No, that's not what God did. The Bible says that Jesus was slain. He's the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. So before God ever said, hey, let there be light, let there be this, let there be that, before God ever created, he had already knew what was going to happen with us. And he already had the plan in place for Jesus to die for us. The cross was already there. And because of that, I'm sure in the mind of God, it it enables him to see the world in that light that the sacrifice has already been made. The question is, does the world see it? And does the world accept the provision that God has provided? But think about the very holiness of God. Think about the very purity of God. I mean, the only thing that, that, the the only vision that, that I seem to make sense of this is to think about 
wa- just watching, and I, and I guess, I, you know, some of you are nurses, and you've actually been there, and you've watched all the procedures and the process that goes on to get the operating room prepared for a surgery. And I don't know about you, but if I was having surgery, I, I would want them to be very cautious, would you not? I would want them to make sure all the utensils are clean. I'd want them to make sure all the, the, the stuff is right in the room. The doctor's washed his hands. And I just, I, don't, I get this envision of the old doctor like this, you know. He's, he's waiting, he's ready to go inside, and he's, he's ready to get his gloves on and go to work, right? But, you know, I'm thinking about that, that pure environment, and then all of a sudden, you know, walking in there, and they're getting ready to put the mask on you, for the, for the funny gas that puts you to sleep, and all of a sudden you look around and there's a rat that runs across the floor. Now, I know I'm weird, Joe. I, I really get that. I know you're probably thinking that, but I, 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 that's what I think about. Because what would you do, like, in that moment? You'd, you'd jump up out of that table and you'd be like, man, get me out of here, you know? I don't want to have an operation in this nasty room, right? Because to me, and I don't know about you, but a rat represents something that's really nasty, okay? <laughs> now, you may have them as pets in your house. I, I don't know, but that's, that's, that's between you and whoever, right? If your family's okay with them, that's okay. But I like to set traps and do whatever I have to do to get rid of them. But think about that. I think when you really get a grasp, just like Isaiah. You remember Isaiah 6 when he saw the Lord? What did he immediately do? He said, man, I'm unclean. I'm a man of unclean lips. He was just, he was blown away by the purity of God and the holiness of God. He didn't feel as if he had any right to be there. So I prayed. I said, God, you know, if this is what it takes, then then your church needs a fresh vision of your holiness. We, we, we need somehow, some way to capture a glimpse of just how holy that you really are. Just what does it mean that you're set apart from creation? What does it mean that you're pure? What does it mean that you're perfect? What does it mean that, that you're just, you're totally the opposite of sin? God, give us a vision of that. Why? So that you and I can live a life of appreciation for the finished work of Jesus Christ. But not only to live a personal life of appreciation, but I know this, the things that matter to us, the things that we enjoy, the things that we appreciate, we have a tendency to pass them on to other people. We have a tendency to like, man, if something is really significant to us, you know, if, if, we're, if, we're, if, we're, if our mindset is this matters, then we have a tendency to want other people to know what matters to us or what's important to us. Because as I think about it, there's only one thing that has turned all of this around for us. There's only one thing that has now taken a hopeless situation and turned it into something that's hopeful. That's taken death and turned it into life. And everything, ladies and gentlemen, centers in the person of Jesus and his death for us on the cross of Calvary. That's what turned it all around. Right? Not my goodness. Not my religiosity, not my standard of morality, not because I don't do what that guy over there does or not because I don't do what that girl over there does. That's not what turned it around for you. That's not what took the the, the destiny of an eternity without God and turned it into a destiny of life with God. The thing that turned it around, ladies and gentlemen, is Jesus and what he did for us at Calvary. That's what turned it around. So can we appreciate that? Do we appreciate that? How do we honor that? Do we just go out here and we live flippantly every day as if my actions and my words don't matter? I hope not. I hope not. Do we continue to let the enemy bombard us with his lies of who he says we are or whether or not we're loved or valued by God? I mean, because 
I tell you, the cross, the message of the cross says something totally different. You know, God is here today. He's with us, not because we're in this place, but He's here because you're here, and He chooses to be here in His people. So one of the things that's really been on my heart lately is I, I, just, I just can't help but believe there's just somebody here. I don't know if it's a person or many people, but there's just somebody here that, that absolutely does not have a relationship with God. I mean, for you, it's more about, uh, I go to church because I'm scared not to go to church. I give my money because I'm scared not to give it because I'm afraid of what's going to happen to me or God getting mad at me. But you really have yet to really step into and embrace the real significance of what Jesus did for you. Because as I say all the time, man, what Jesus did, the significance of, he did what he did to bring you to God so that you could actually enjoy God right now and forevermore. And some of you are not enjoying God because you still continue to put yourself at the center of your universe. But you know, the message of the cross always does. It always provides the same exact invitation every time. And it always says, come. Come and enjoy God. Come and, and, and understand and experience what life is like when I'm at the center of things. And that's a choice, right? It's a choice and an opportunity you have to make. So I'm encouraging you. I've been praying for you. That today might be the day when you say, God, I'm sick and tired of religious life. Of just kind of faking it to make it and pretending like I really got something that I really don't have. But man, God, I, I want that. I see that in other people and I want to experience that. Well, the good thing is it's there. All you got to do is take it. All you got to do is take it. And for Christians, I really truly believe that you know, God is constantly dealing with our hearts because he has a plan and he has a purpose for you. He has a difference that he wants to make through your life. And we got to surrender to it. We got a choice with that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for another day. I just thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to share these things. Don't, don't quite know who it was for. Don't quite understand, Lord, how you're going to use it all. But I just know that... Um, when we think about this time of year and when we reflect upon what you've done for us. You know, the cross is central. We know there's an empty tomb and we'll get to that, Father, but we know that the cross is very central, God, to the finished work that Jesus has done. It's a done deal. And so, Lord, as we proclaim this, as we proclaim this truth, Father, my prayer is that you would open the hearts and open the minds and eyes spiritual eyes and hearts of people to to embrace this God to really understand that have you had you not stepped in in our behalf in our situation and that predicament caused by sin then we would that, that, that it would be bad news so we thank you father we thank you for your amazing grace that we're able to sing about the amazing grace that we're able to it's able to empower us and free us every day as we walk with you. So, Father, I just pray that your people, that people would respond in the way, God, that you're dealing with them and their hearts to respond today. And I ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand with me?